shot over here. And then we come around. And there you go. And then we start over here. Jimmy. Good You're still having trouble with your camera, mate. Ah, uh, cool. <laughs> Jimmy. Ah, uh, good one, Jim. Good one, Sam. Right, thanks, Rob. Right here, Robert. Get rid of that thing in the back. Get rid of that rabbit. Mr. Page, please. Get out of the way. Get rid of the rabbit. Mr. Pine and Jimmy. Mr. Pine. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Excellent. Oh, you're coming this way. Okay, that's about yeah, it. Yeah, you can be strong in the morning, but you can't. Yeah. Well, very. Something else. Look, look, there's all people here. They're all, they're all witnessing the fact that. Do it for him. Um, you the 60s, mate. What well, happens next? Oh, you just keep wandering around everywhere we go. At some point, I'm going to need to sit down because there's no, uh, no photos to be taken during the actual question period. So. <laughs> Rex King, he knows. Yes. Put about another hand for Jimmy Page and Robert Page. Thank you, Rex. Thank you, Rex. Thank you, Rex. You don't really need this, do you? I was touring in America um, throughout most of last year, and I got approached by MTV to do that thing. And uh, I thought it was a bit in inappropriate because obviously I would not only do solo stuff, but I'd have to do it with Let's Have stuff. And um, it seemed to be, although I've got a bit of a problem with my ego. It would be a bit ridiculous to try and take all the glory for all those songs from 1968 to 1980. So, um, I said yes. No, no. <laughs> so, uh, I, Jimmy and I started talking about if we did do something together, how we would go about, you know, developing a program that would try and personify what we did in the past but at the same time contemporise it enough so that it didn't, wasn't too jaundiced <clears throat> and also wasn't too obvious. I mean, there are so many, you know, there's only so many ways to skin a, a rabbit. And uh, the one way would be to go on and be the kind of archetypal ageing rock icons, or the other way would be to give it a lot of th some thought, which is something that we'd never done in the past. Every time we'd been approached to do anything together, we'd done it in the, amount, the shortest amount of time without a great deal of thought and I think nervousness and adrenaline and stuff played a part in making it less of a, an event and more of a fiasco. So by um, settling down and, <clears throat> and discussing how we would do it and how we would elaborate on the past and how we would present a present and a future, we actually did the first practical and logical thing that we'd done for many years together. It was interesting. And that, like that was from well, we gave you some old memories. We want to give you some new ones. Well, I mean, to, to renew it, I mean, take the material that was from the first Zeppelin era, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, and to make it new and to contemporise it. And that's always been a policy. Well, yeah, not so much contemporise, it's just, uh, you know, the, the whole world has opened up in every respect since we first wrote Friends and Kashmir and stuff. When we did write those songs, we'd already recorded in India in 1971, 72, uh, with the Bombay, part of a Bombay Symphony Orchestra, and we'd recorded Friends and Four Sticks way back then, but just, actually, just for an afternoon to see what it would sound like, certainly not with a career view. <coughs> but um, as, as time's gone on and the whole idea of fusing music from all different parts of the world is now more feasible, then it's not so much how we can accept doing it, but how the people that you approach from Morocco or from Egypt, or they're much more open to the whole deal now. And so the, the doors are open to work in more or less any situation. The only problem is that a lot of the work that goes on, <clears throat> I go to Morocco a lot, and the Ganawa, who we worked with, 
you can buy cassettes of the Ganawa playing jazz fusion. And I mean, man, that's so bad. I mean, it's just terrible that, that, that a lot of the kind of combinations of people from the desert or from the mountains in the less populated parts of the world, they end up playing with Stanley Clark type of situations, which I don't understand why world music often gets tagged with this fusion thing, because it's such a kind of emasculating process. Uh, <laughs> and, and anyway, how do you get an, a Tuareg Arab to take his snakeskin boots off <laughs> and become a jazzer? So the thing is, it's much more appropriate now and much easier. The doors are open to work more or less with anybody, anytime. Just keep away from jazz. Next question. Well, shut up then. You're not doing a bad job, really. <laughs> nice guy, though. Is there a light by any chance? <laughs> Jim, I've got some matches here. Oh, thank you. Next question. Who's Thanks, next? Robert. Pass the acid. Yes. Sorry. Do you first of all, Trevor? Uh, yeah, Trevor Jackson from. Nice mic. Yeah. Uh, Trevor Jackson from Radio Triple. Um, same place as him. I won't hog the uh, conference as he did. Just anybody, how much... Is there anybody not from this radio station? <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah. Do you want uh, to hang on a bit? How much hesitation... <laughs> I told you they were mouthy down here. Look, my mic's packed up. Nice deal, this. Ah, yeah, you can have mine. <laughs> <laughs> you must be the bloke who does the Stones PA as well. No, no, you're, you're going to do some talking too. Yeah, I know, but I was just... Lending a hand if the mic had fallen down. How much hesitation was there when you first got into the studio? I mean, obviously, there was a little bit of apprehension there, thinking, well, look, this has been a while since we've done this, and. No. You're choreographing this whole thing. I went to the toilet. Actually, no, Jim went to the toilet for ages. <laughs> Do you remember you. Uh, <laughs> did I? Yeah. I'm surprised you noticed, Robert. Well, I'd had three shaves by the time you came back. <laughs> and while I was away, we started work. <laughs> okay, next question. All right, over here. Hang on, there's a bloke here. Over here, guys. Very, uh, oh, there. <laughs> I don't know how you stole Paul Thompson from The Cure. Oh, he gave up. <laughs> He's married. Well, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> He just couldn't drink enough absinthe and um, he just didn't have the same capacity for excess during the concert that, that um, Robert did. And basically, it's a rigmarole. He found out that although The Cure at one point were really, really making new ground and, and uh, contributing to good changes within, inside this c cocoon, he found in the end that, they, that the cure had started to look to everybody else to make sure that they weren't getting left behind and, and that's not really what he wanted to do. So he quit. And how did you guys find him? Well, he lives in the middle of a stone circle in Cornwall. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Next. You, you didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. I thought everybody knew that. Here we go. Here we go. What's the thing you hate most reading about yourselves or hearing about yourselves in the media? <laughs> what do we hate most? Yeah. Don't think we do, we? Do. I don't, no, I don't think it's there's anything great. we hate. Huh? It's all great. Not great. It's uh, bearable. In any particular country, because media is different all the way, everywhere. Uh, worldwide, make a selection. Well, I don't know what, you, what, what you're thinking about, so I can't really answer the question. What sort people of get my age know? wrong. <laughs> yeah. Some people say Yeah, that actually, in, 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 there was a review in England where <clears throat> Robert was his age and I was 60, which I thought was rather funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's good, that's good. And somebody said I once went out with Jermaine Greer. Uh, there's lots of things, but it doesn't matter. It's only a no, game. No. Yeah. Isn't it? What about, pressure, what about pressure from the media to call yourselves Led Zeppelin? Are you the well, pressure? Oh, sure, sure up then. <laughs> doesn't matter, does it really? No. I'm Rumpelstiltskin. <laughs> <laughs> Was the exclusion of uh, John Paul Jones uh, 
an obvious sort of... Shut up. <laughs> no. An obvious. Yeah. No. Uh, are you... Well, are you obvious? Because I like the way you hold the mic. Do you do this Tony Bennett thing? Uh, yeah. Hang on, I gotta... Haven't you heard my album? <laughs> if it got as much play as my last one, probably no. <laughs> Deb, take that microphone off this man. No, I just wanted to uh, basically uh, clarify the fact that just you two working together would try and stop people from labelling it a Led Zeppelin reunion. Do you know Lazy River? No. Not believe <laughs> Oh, it don't matter. It's just that Jonesy was busy, and we're busy. And okay, we, 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 when we started working, we came up with a lot, we were writing a lot of, well, right from day one or day two, we had four things written. Then we started working with Charlie and Michael, the rhythm section, and we, we, we've got like nine numbers that uh, you haven't heard yet. Uh, we were, you know, moving along at such a rapid pace and momentum moving, grew to the point where... You're not responsible for, you know, I mean, you don't... If you want to go and have a romance uh, on a Friday or a Saturday, you don't have to go out with your wife or your ex-wife. You know, you don't have to... You don't have to be completely chained to the kind of what was the modus operandi all those years before. You know, um, I don't think it's important. I just think that if, you, if there's anything left of some kind of existentialist mo great moment in time in this completely contrived environment, then it ought to be that you do what you want to do when you want to do it, do it as long as you like, and then fuck off. You know, and just leave it. Forget it. If it doesn't, if it doesn't feel good one morning, you don't have to bring everybody back in and all get on the same gear, you know? Jonesy with the onions on, the, on his jacket and all that. <laughs> Wearing the wig in song remains the same. I mean, <laughs> he's still got the same wife. He doesn't need us. Next question, thanks. Um, just a question for Jimmy. Um, how much would the, sorry, how, how's the songwriting going? How ambitious are you for, for the future in terms of composition and stuff? Well, as I was saying earlier, <clears throat> when we got together, we started writing, and, 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 and it was just that was the idea, really, to see whether we could get on together after all the, that amount of time. Fourteen years is a long time to to pass, and in actual fact, you know, we, we did a lot of uh, writing right from the kickoff. And I don't know about you know writing the whole process. People like to say, you know, what is the writing process? It's, I guess it's just inspiration. Um, and that's it, you know, I mean, today I'll write this, tomorrow I'll write something else, you know. And at the moment there's a, a joint partnership, that's rather interesting. It's a, it's a lotus. <laughs> Have you, you've, when will you record your new, the new compositions that you've made? Let me get a day off. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> that's about it really. That's, um, well, we go home one day. And um, about four days after that, it'll be a good idea to, do, to start recording. <laughs> but it'll probably be the middle of December. It'll be good to see Paul can play, you know, make it, extend it electrically, because right now Paul Thompson from The Cure has only been playing <clears throat> acoustically. But you know, that, qu that kind of personality of guitar playing that he's got, you know, could be really, really great against Jimmy's arpeggio work. It's, it stands to be electrically something quite dumbfounding. So you will have an album full of new songs? Yeah. Cool. Absolutely. <clears throat> well, we've nearly done it now. Ms. McCabe? Hello. Hi. Um, when you were saying about uh, how quickly the songs started coming, did that surprise you at all? Were you actually sort of pinching yourselves that, that you know, the, the caliber of quality material that you're coming up with? So incredibly. I don't know whether it's that good. But um, <clears throat> I think the most, most important thing about it was, was that, that our channels were open. <coughs> I think although, uh, I think we'd missed each other. We can create mood and stuff which pleases us if it, and that's the, really what's the most important thing. It always was. And it should always remain that way. And that's what Paul's argument was about when he left the cure was that once upon a time they, they did it, their, you know, they always had their own mood and their own creation. If you listen to some of the stuff on Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, it's br absolutely brilliant. But then they started becoming weenie weenie bop bop. <laughs> and then it was almost better to play to 70,000 people and be weenie bop. Call the album No, no Chorus. Yeah, yeah. No Chorus, what a great name for a project. <laughs> <laughs> Gentleman in the back on the right here. Yeah. Four new songs and ten three 
both songs. Is it is the new album aimed at more the older audience, your your old fans, or say new fans? And what's the chance of seeing you guys play live, like the new songs? Like, is there any chance of coming back? Sure. Sure. No, no. I mean, that's the whole, you know, that's what it's all about, really, is playing it and people hearing it, what we're doing, and uh, just sure we'll be back. The, the old songs are not the old songs anymore. I mean, they aren't the old songs, because they're so different. When that guy hits, when Hossam Ramsey starts the rhythm percussion in Kashmir, that, that ain't the old song. And when the man stands up and plays for his for, for his God and his country with the violin. That's not an old song. That's a whole new and different ball game. You could, you could actually take those segments out and put them somewhere else and they're totally different and totally new and very inspired, I think. <clears throat> and will the old fans like it? I doubt it. They're already ODing on Chris Rear. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris. <laughs> My manager, if he was here now, would be scowling, saying, don't knock anybody. <laughs> but I've had my Valium, so I'm all right. Back row, I'm the, you're right, gentlemen. Uh, Richard, we've been on the Miles Zeppelin for taxi, but um, with Led Zeppelin being the most bootleg band ever, that's something about three hundred times available, and you guys built your reputation on really brilliant live performances, why hasn't it been to this stage well, the song remains the same for start. Actually, if you've only got 250, I've just been to Japan and I've got more than that. <laughs> the whole trunk full. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't pay for it, <laughs> Absolutely not, no. Actually, I think there's about a thousand out there. Anyone? Have you got any in mind releasing some live material? Like, you've just released what you've done. No, I'm going to make a compilation of bootlegs, actually. Put it out officially. Well, I think that... I think it's uh, live is live, and when live's finished being live, it's gone. You know? I mean, I can't stand listening to what happened. You know, I remember... No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I remember... Um, Okay, I do. But when John Anderson and all that, they used to play in Yes, and they used to go back to the hotel room, rig the Revox up, get some brown rice, and sit there for another three hours listening to what they'd just played. I mean, what the fuck's the point of that? I mean, it ain't that good ever. Anyway, you've got to be there, feel it, and then, and then go and do something else. Live is... Well, is it self-indulgent, Jim? No, it's not self-indulgent, okay. Robert. Point the self-indulgence. Wow, pointless self-indulgence, it's not. We're living in an age where too much is that one is barely enough. <laughs> well, it's very sweet of you to say that. <clears throat> I've got some dodgy tracks you can buy, buy off me in the foyer. <laughs> this gentleman down here in the front on your right, guys. You haven't got any uh, tour dates set for Australia? Rex? <laughs> yes, you do, absolutely. When? When? <laughs> But that's now. No, it's next year. Ah, see? We know what we're doing. <laughs> it's a you know, multi-million dollar management organisation <laughs> later next year. Will you be taking the same uh, musicians that you had with the No Quarter film that we saw last night? Will we see those on the tour with you, or, or most of those? Or Obviously, you enjoy the experience of working with them. Will we have the chance to see them as well? Or? Really hope so. That's that's the idea of disposing turn up on the first ring that sort of thing. And, and, and it was even a, a you know a struggle getting three of them in there. I know two of them have got shorts. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. Nice no, no, no. yeah, yeah, well, there we go. You, you mentioned the influence of uh, travelling on your music. Any plans to uh, sing some music? <laughs> 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 It's, uh, there's a bit more to it than that, isn't it? <clears throat> there's a bit more to it than that. It would be a wonderful experience, especially this time of the year. Um, but the answer is right now, no. There isn't any time. 
I was 8.32 and I've gone on this promotional tour. <laughs> I just think that Jimmy's guitar work with a didgeridoo in the background is perfect. We had, we had two didgeridoo, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, when, when we were sort of doing the initial like, run throughs of numbers and things, and I brought in a couple of didgeridoo players that, uh, for one of them was an old friend of mine. We, 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 we had two didgeridoo players playing on Friends initially. But that's the way that things went. You know, we changed things around at the end of the day. It turned out the way that uh, you've heard it. But, you know, we were up for experimenting in, in many different areas. Shall we with his hand out in the front here? Uh, just on the, the album you just recorded, it sounds like you put a hell of a lot of effort and uh, into reworking the songs real. There are certain areas that it's, when you're making a record, and, and most importantly, the film, because the film is, is, when you see that, you get the plot. If you don't see it, maybe you miss it, you know, you, you miss it a bit. But, um, you know, it's pretty self-evident, something like Ron Ross, Don't Miss Can Work With The Egyptians. <laughs> It depends who's pressing my button. <laughs> <laughs> is that a hint? <laughs> it's so cheesy. Hey, is, is that a hint? <laughs> um, <laughs> not unless you speak audio now. But <laughs> well, I'm sure you're going to crash course. Now, it doesn't matter. You do what you do what, and you want to be... I didn't think I could sing high stuff but I can but it's if you play with people who don't in, inspire it it's also you've got to be incredibly careful with that whole idea behind it being some kind of currency that, that makes you more of a man because if you buy any heavy metal magazine and you see all these blokes looking a bit weird with latex trousers they're doing it all the time and they've got to get undressed sometime or another play golf <laughs> So I think the whole, <clears throat> as long as we make sense, then this is it. And, and if we didn't make sense, I don't think I'd want to make a solo album again anyway. I'd like to do duets. <laughs> With Elton. <laughs> this lady here. Um, you've got such a focus on um, Egyptian and Indian music in, in this album. Um, is that because of the future, or do you plan to be Sorry, a blueprint for what? Of the future. Of the future? Um, well, as far as the, uh, the blueprint, I mean, there was a certain aspect of a blueprint in the past, if you want to put it that way. Uh, the fact of playing with, with, with you know, other, other you know, personalities, and, you know, musically, so to speak, can be an inspiration, and, and you take it in an organic sense, the same way that we got here at this point, you know, working with the, uh, with, uh, the Egyptians, the Moroccans, and uh, you know, the, the Celtic areas and, and, uh, of um, Nigel Eaton, for instance, on the hurdy-gurdy. I mean, you can be inspired by working with these people, and uh, that, that's basically what it is. If, you, if, you know, if, you, if you're in a room and you get to, you know, there's, there's a, like a particular sort of ident identity of sound coming from somebody, then you can get inspired by it, and who knows what comes next. But, uh, up to this point, it's been pretty good. We always dealt with drones when we made music. A lot of the time we, we were using drones of one kind or another, either big guitar layered drones or, <coughs> or keyboard or... And I think the hurdy-gurdy as an instrument gives, allows you to have this kind of um, pad of sonic mystery. <laughs> this kind of mysterious you know, sound that goes along, which means that you can sing anything from a Beatles song to, you know, uh, burn up. Begin songs. When we played Friends, they came up and said, look, we've got a way of starting it. And it was the drone. And it was amazing. And the drone's so moving. And every time you get out of the Anglo-Saxon world, the drone's there. And that's all you need. Kathy McCabe in the centre on your left, guys, is there? You've been speaking a lot about the music making sense. That seems to be the word that, that keeps coming up. Are you excited about the future of the music industry? Are you excited about the music The music, this music now? Yeah. No, it's fucking awful. <laughs> <laughs> what time did you get up? <laughs> <laughs> Too early. <laughs> I don't know how you feel. 
<laughs> yes, of course, it's exciting. It's because. I mean, you're sounding very logical about it. It had to make sense. It said, sort of well, it had to make sense right. because it, it would have been an absolute waste of time. I don't think either of us want to waste our time. I mean, if a miss is as good as a mile if you don't get it right. You know, there's a lot of cohesions, there's a lot of uh, people who get together from different cultures and religious backgrounds and, and ethnic backgrounds who try and make music together and, they, and it's marketed in a certain way and it doesn't work because it's too polite or it's not, it's not real. The thing is that these guys were giving us as much as we were giving them. They were contributing quite vividly to what we were doing and, and, and the excitement was for Jimmy and I to stand there dumbfounded because we had the kernel of an idea but they took it and they went, okay, now we'll show you what we do because we are the supreme players of the Middle East because all music in the Middle East comes from Cairo and every time I mention Morocco, which is my second home, they were going, nah, nothing, walu, nothing at all. We carry the music of the Middle East. Everybody comes to us. Fayrouz from Lebanon, she uses Egyptian players, you know, she plays in Sydney a lot. I saw her last time I was here and everybody the whole musical center of the Middle East gravitates from Cairo and from the Umm Kalsum school of music, if you like. So it's so exciting because we are we just we're, we're like a pair of amateurs, really, with a little bit of money, <laughs> a lot of freedom. Well, yeah, you can make mistakes; it doesn't matter, does it? As long as somebody else is paying for it. <laughs> On your uh, right, here goes. We've been talking about. Um Australian music, which is possible. You ought to do this one, really. <laughs> well, there's Led Zeppelin tributes and tributes. Um, We're a tribute. What, what you mean, like that, uh, the Stairway to Heaven and stuff and all that? <coughs> I, mean I thought that's hilarious, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, it's Hey, wait, great. Stephen. That's right. Um, I, well, I haven't, you know, I'm not absolutely au fait with all the, all the bands you're talking about, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. I thought it was, it was a lot of fun. I like the big fat Elvis version. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. The one that, uh, from that uh, the program. Yeah, you know the yeah. one that the guy who does it to the tune of Viva Las Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> and also, my mom cried when the big choir sang "Still in Heaven." <laughs> you know, but then again, she had had a couple of sherries. <laughs> <laughs> How old are you, son? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you heard the legend? Anybody who says that word more than twice a day gets sent to Canberra. <laughs> Besides, photographers aren't allowed to ask questions. <laughs> yeah, don't get too relaxed. La lady in the front row, on your left, guys. Is it true that I'm from the United American children can see I wasn't there. <laughs> Do you feel, are you responsible for any conceptions? That you Next. Yeah. <laughs> they were never immaculate anyway. <laughs> Front row. I like... Oh no. When I go through the motions of conception, well, I fake it, you know, but... I used to like Massive Attack. I thought that did the job. <laughs> Front row. No. 15 minutes, 5 minutes, what, what do you mean by being well, famous? Being famous do you like the, the what do you mean, is there any really, like, pressure relative to that, is that what you mean? Yeah, pressure, you no, there's not. <clears throat> oh, it is, it's bloody hopeless. No, what it is, is you have to have it three times a day. It's like medicine. You have to be adored. <laughs> you know, and if you're not adored, then you have to go off and do, and say, love me, love me. <laughs> Uh, it's true. I mean, I don't know why you say that, because it's absolutely true. You know, <clears throat> people make pitiful gestures just to keep the adoration <laughs> counter going, you know? I'm not going to mention who, <laughs> but they do. And you're only a photographer. <laughs> only. Front row on your right, guys. Yeah, uh, you recorded when the levee breaks. Why wasn't it on the album? I forgot the words. 
And also on the American version of the CD, there's uh, Wawa's been left off of it. What is that? Australia's got one extra track from America. Well, this is our first romance with phonogram. <laughs> <laughs> There's all sorts of cock-ups everywhere. I mean, you know. Good song. Wawa's great, yeah. Mm. Thank you. I love it. Um, I don't know. You know, Fader Nations was with phonogram, and uh, <clears throat> there are moves that are made in London, which, which in the end move right across the world. Decisions that are made after a heavy lunch, corporate lunch, I don't know, things happen that, you know, and then you, you can't actually send a copy of Wawa on a cassette in the post to everybody. It, yeah, it was left off. Yeah, there's no logic behind it. It might be the difference between the cost of records in Europe and the cost of records in America. I mean, it could be some corporate ploy. I think we should have a... Is that the logic ombudsman. behind it? I don't know. We should have an ombudsman looking into this. <laughs> hey, <laughs> oi, oi, hey, 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 hey. Keep up. Are you going to release when the levy breaks later or stuff? I don't know. It wasn't that great, actually. Nobody's fault but mine worked better than that yeah, of the two. Go with your hand up there on your I left, guys. The baby as well. Ah, yeah. Um, what is uh, something that you're being around now that you guys have been doing you know, a lot of stuff today? You know, what's the thing He said, <clears throat> yeah. what new bands do you like? <laughs> um, I think Beck, Beck is good. I mean, the new one, not the Jeff one. <laughs> the Jeff one is good too, but I'm talking about, you're talking about new bands. You know, I, I think the material on his album is really, really uh, imaginative. The Soundgarden, you know, that'll do for the moment, won't it? I like Porter's Head. I think, have you, has that come out here yet? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think she sings great, and I think I like Blind Melon. I think the kid who sings in Blind Melon takes a lot from Gla uh, Glace, Grace Slick, <laughs> Strange Teeth. Uh, I love the Black Crows because they're <clears throat> they're they're great. They just they're real magpies, but they're really good. They, I think if anything, they they're one of the few bands that actually doesn't doesn't give a flying hoot and just has a great time and they don't go out to make records that are going to fit perfectly in the <coughs> you know following John Bon Jovi around that sort of thing the I want to like Rollins but he won't let me <laughs> <laughs> the big Led Zeppelin fan back row right, right hand Well, I'll tell you about the guitar. It, it, it was actually, <clears throat> it was self-painted at the time. It was sort of like flames and things. And, and I went away on, on tour, <clears throat> it was, you know, like about 1971, something like that. And a friend of mine thought he'd redesign it while I was away and, and repainted it. So it's sort of, yeah, that's right. So it's, it's sitting around with like a, t a totally new sort of modulating pattern on it. But, it's not that brown uh, it, one. I've still got it anyway. No, it's not the brown one, no. Well, the ones where I didn't have like injured fingers for a start. Uh, yeah, they were. The the yeah, no, but they, 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 I, I enjoyed all of that. Tell me just as much as I still enjoy what I'm doing now. But they, you know, they're all good. You know, I always put everything I had into what I was doing then. Same, at least you know, I still got that much uh, motivation now too. Tell them how you messed your finger up. Twice actually over two tours. Remember in San Diego Airport? Yeah. Yeah. Climbing fences. Yeah, but I didn't. I wasn't going up the same fence. <laughs> um, <laughs> as to which tour. <laughs> which tour was the best? 
I don't know, I can't, I can't remember him, but I do know I looked quite happy in about 1973. <laughs> <laughs> when all them t-shirts, you know, so you have that... So, so do you. Yeah. It's amazing what you can do, you know, with a good night's sleep. <laughs> There was a lot of energy that, at that time. We just came back from Morocco, didn't we? Mm -hmm. We were pretty... Um, we'd experienced quite a few extremes just prior to going on stage for the whole of that year. So it was, it was more exciting than, than... Actually, we than, went to Morocco after that. Did we really? Yeah. yeah. Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> then why was I like that then? Um, I don't know. <laughs> It was a lot of energy, a lot of happiness then. I don't know whether it was that great playing-wise, because you can't be that happy and play good, can you, really? The Presence album, that was probably the most criticised. Did you agree with that? Like, I thought it was your personal favourite because of the stress. Who's, who are you directing that? Sorry? Personal favourite, who's personal favourite? Oh, to, to either, uh, personal favourite. Well, it was done in three weeks. And considering the other album. But then again, so was in through the outdoor. Mm. Um, first album was done in 36 hours, so I mean, it's, all, it's, all a, it's all a matter of time and a race against time, really, isn't it? It takes that long now to get in a limo. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> By the time Zeppelin finished, nobody had gone down to the lobby because they were always waiting for the next bloke to go down because they knew he wouldn't go down to the lobby. So, in the end, it could take hours to even get out of the hotel. Once we left New York, two hours after the crowd were ready for us to go on stage in Philadelphia. And we were still in the lobby in New York. I didn't make it to the lobby. <laughs> no, you passed go and went straight to jail. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Anybody else that hasn't asked any questions? It feels the burning desire. Okay, then. Yeah. Is it, do you feel like your age is shining as opposed to the music? Or? <coughs> well, you know, you journalists, you're not short of the odd cliche, are you? <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know whether you're... Are you a journalist? No, I am. Yeah. I yeah. You look quite young for it, really. But, I mean, I think, you know, journalism is... There's nothing... Not all these cliches are what they are. We're old blokes, you know. I don't think we're dinosaurs, because, you know, we can procreate. Our, li our line hasn't finished yet, you know. Um, but we're definitely not real, and certainly not normal. <laughs> it's not disheartening, though. It's rather nice. <laughs> OK, we've got one more minute to go, and uh, gentlemen on the right here, guys. We've got to do 7,000 TV shows now. <laughs> Over here oh, on the right, guys. I'm not neurotic about it failing, this project at all, you know. Okay, let's have somebody who hasn't said a word. The gentleman with the beard. The best. Like I think it's great, yeah. <laughs> uh, recording all those years ago, would we recording on four tracks? What track? With? I don't know that number. How, how's it compared now? Like, when recording now as it was, as it was then, how much more can you put on a record? What you could do then? Has it made your creativity better or any worse? Well, it's still imagination, isn't it? That's what comes down to at the end of the day. Do you have, do you have more scope for more double or more scope for more things on a on a record on the road? Does that uh, take away or add to your your ability to put them on then? At the end of the day, is it more creative or less creative? I think the more the more options that you have, the more you explore and the longer it takes and the and and you tend to lose what was the kernel of a really good or original organic idea. I think <coughs> a lot of yeah, the as stuff... as long as you don't do that, though. That's right. And I think a lot of the... If you listen to the, some of the more crea really, really creative times in music, especially like toward the end of the 60s, what was happening in San Francisco and in London and stuff like that, would, and the kind of time, the process of writing with the aeroplane, Grateful Dead, and pe <clears throat> all that whole movement, which is a social movement too. If, you, if it took you more than two days to make an album, there was something radically wrong. 
you know, um, Pick Withers, an old friend of mine from Dire Straits, who left Dire Straits and didn't team up with... Um, he, he said it took two weeks in New York to get a snare drum sand <laughs> for Dire Straits, because they were going through all the samples. You know, and in the end, nobody knows. I'd much rather listen to Gene Vincent anyway. <laughs> So I think the more choices you've got and the more options, you become so studio au fait with everything. It becomes, first started working again together was there were two of us in a room with, with five drum loops which were concocted in Paris by a producer. And there was a guitar amp and a microphone. And, a, and I, we just pressed the button and recorded the stuff. <clears throat> and what we got warts and all was the most amazing sound and when I play it at home it sounds like if you did anything technical to it now it sound it would diminish its power so technology has a lot to answer for really well whatever it is main part of it is you don't want to lose the initial spark of what what is there within the number and it's like what we're saying about you know Pick withers and he's, you know, trying to find a snare drum sound. By the time he's got the snare drum sound, you've lost the spark. You know. Yeah, I think uh, that, that's <coughs> all important that you don't lose that. And we were conceptually a four-piece well, band when we started. And how much more can you do than our four pieces, really? You know, as time went on and we got more opportunity, there was more guitar overdubs and stuff. But that was all you needed. I think the 80s, the beginning of the 80s, the techno era. Um, when keyboards came to the fore and, and before MIDI interface, in the Howard Jones time, Nick Kershaw, all that sort of post new romantic thing, I think everything got, I think the actual soul of music was substituted for, you know, Human League. <laughs> <laughs> and I bought that Love Unlimited Orchestra thing. Okay, last Human question. Human League with no vocals. Think of that. For this last. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, the Arbor just some, some re really innovative, uh, made some really innovative music and statements. And uh, each of the guitarists that were involved did their own part, you know. Thank you very much, everybody. Try and, you know. Ladies and gentlemen, Uh, lots of uh, space on various publications and stations and television stations and things. Thank you.